Hey, I'm Christine, and I want to thank you for joining us in person and online for worship this morning. If you're looking for a community of people here at First Baptist Startful, we have community groups that meet every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. They're a great place to grow spiritually and meet other people at First Baptist. If you're new with us today, we'd love to know that you visited and help you take your best next step at First Baptist Startful. The best way to do that is to fill out a Connect card. You can grab one from the pew in front of you, fill it out, and drop it in any offering drop box on campus. If you're a first-time guest, bring your Connect card to the Cove, which is right behind me, after the service so we can bless you with a guest box. In it, you'll find some more information about our church, a free book, and discounts from some of the businesses around Starkville. We're about to get started, so from wherever you are right now, let's sing, pray, and learn together. Good morning, church. Hope you all had a great, fantastic Thanksgiving. So we're so grateful to have you back here this Sunday as we continue to celebrate this Advent season together of our Lord's coming. So if you will, bow your heads as we pray together this morning. Father, we're incredibly just grateful this season of the many things you've blessed us with. But most importantly, as we take some time over the next few weeks to celebrate Advent, the arrival of of our Messiah, may we realize the magnitude of the, and the weight of what you've done for us and what you've accomplished through the manger, through the cross, and through the empty grave. So may this season be one where you're just drawing our hearts in to you, to your purposes and your will for our lives. So in this season, we would live out the calling you've given us as we spread the joy of the Messiah to all those around us. Thank you for the service that we can come and we can sing these songs and worship you as the Lord and risen Savior that you are. And thank you just for calling us to be a part of what you're doing in this world. We're so grateful. We're so um, just indebted to the mercies you've showed us. So may you be glorified this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together and let's begin uh, singing praise the Star King. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 
Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. We go, all hail the power. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem. song and crown him Lord of all will join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all we continue in our worship this morning this next song um, is one we haven't done before but I hope that you will catch on to the lyrics and sing sing with us because it's just such an as we talk about the majesty of God and and how wonderful Jesus is and everything that he's done this song just does a really great job of pointing our eyes to him Here 
Christ be magnified. be magnified let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me won't you stand with us again as we can I'll stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too And I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway To resurrection life if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my soul will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified. In me, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. God, I, I just say, I ask that that will be our prayer, that will be the posture of our hearts this morning, that we will be um, just solely focused on you, our hearts will be turned to you, our ears will be open to what you have to say to us, and that you will be magnified in this place among your people. I thank you for bringing us together. You are just so amazing. Thanks for all that you are and all that you do. In your name we pray. Amen.
You know, and, and change is inevitable, and as we live our lives, the more we change. The older I get, the more I realize that things are not the same as they once were, whether that's a feeling that I have inside of me or just looking out at the world. But I want to ask a question as we think about how often we change and how change comes. How do you make sense of the world? How do you make sense of the world. There's chaos in the world all around us. I don't have to convince you that there is chaos in the world, but it is my obligation to show you or to tell you the cause of the chaos in the world. And the cause of the chaos in the world is a, is a word that we avoid. It's a word that we, are, we think that is unpopular. It's a word that is ugly. But the word and the reason for chaos in the world is a three-letter word. It's the word sin. That was a British journalist by the name of Malcolm Muggeridge. That's a fun British name, right? Muggeridge. He sa- I'm really not sure if I'm saying it right. But anyway, Malcolm Muggeridge, he said, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time the most intellectually resisted fact. Listen to that again. The depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time the most intellectually resisted fact. So we've come as a society, just consider, we've come a lot of way, a long way in our progress. For example, I'm so glad that in the South we have air conditioning, right? I'm glad that we have something called penicillin, even though I'm allergic to it. I'm still glad that there's something out there called penicillin. I'm also glad for indoor plumbing. These are the kinds of things. We've come a long way in our progress. But listen, all of our progress, if we're not careful, it can provide the illusion that we can outgrow our problems. But some things we will never be able to progress past without divine intervention. And that is such a Christian thing for us to say and agree upon right away, that there will always be someone hurting, there will always be the poor, Someone is always mourning. The question of our hearts through the ages as we age and advance and progress is when will it be no more? And is there then salvation for us? What are we going to do? Well, we need a salvation that comes beyond our efforts. We need someone to come to us and bind up the broken and make us new. And salvation is exactly what God in Christ has come to do. Now, if what I have said is is true, if everything that I've said is true, if Christ is the hope of the world, then you and I ought to be constantly putting down our nets and following Him. If Christ is the hope of the world, if the hope of Christmas is the hope of the world, and we ought to celebrate this not just once a year, twice a year, once a week, twice a week, three times a week, once a day. No, we ought to celebrate this fact every moment. And through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you believer, you get to live with this hope all the time. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have sad days or rainy days, or, but you have something that anchors your, your soul. You have hope. And I want to invite you today to come explore this hope with me. Now, we're in our Advent series, and we've called this series, Come Adore on Bended Knee, and we're looking at the story of Christmas, one little section in the story of Christmas in Matthew chapter 2. And in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew gives us clues on how it is we ought to celebrate Christmas. And the clue that he gives us on how we ought to celebrate Christmas is right here in verse 1 of chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, 
wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, Matthew's the only one of all the gospel writers, he's the only one to include this section. And the detail here in the birth narrative of Jesus is there to help us understand why Christmas is such a big deal. You see, what we celebrate is not just a silent night, a holy night where all is calm and all is bright, right? At the birth of Jesus, we celebrate the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Listen, Matthew puts the birth of Jesus in cosmic terms. What does that mean? Whole world terms. This one little event is going to change the entire cosmos, is going to change the entire universe, is going to change the entire existence of humanity forever. Jesus came bringing the end with him. And they were wise men from the east that knew it. But here's a question that is, that is sort of baked into Matthew. How did wise men from the east get it? And the religious leaders in Jerusalem miss it. How did they get it? And everyone else missed it. And this is really, if we were to do a study in Matthew, and Lord willing, we will do one one day, it'll be a long one. I'll go ahead and tell you, I love Matthew. But Matthew, there's always this, this, uh, this paradox where people that should get it don't get it. The Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile ruler, even the demons get it. But the religious leaders, and in some cases, even those closest to Jesus, they just don't get it. And so this is sort of the question that sort of arises from this text as we read it. It's not just about us setting up our nativity scene. Some of you, like me, you've still got the wise men way far away, right? They're not supposed to be there in your nativity scene. You've got them way far away. But the question is, how did wise men from the east get it and the religious leaders in Jerusalem miss it? That's the first question. And the second question is, is there a way for us textually, not with speculation, but is there a way textually for us to discover what these wise men knew? And of course, I believe there is, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. But look at, let's look at Matthew just for a moment. Matthew says that these men are not just any kind of men, they're wise men. Now, that term, wise men, it's a loaded term. The Greek word transliterated to our English for wise men is magi, magi. And that word magi is an old Babylonian word. Now, for those of you who uh, grew up with the Bible or have any knowledge of the Bible, are you beginning to see some of these connections that are already being drawn for us just by considering the word magi? Well, If not, let's then ask a question. Does the Bible say anything about Babylon? Well, sure. It says a great deal about Babylon. Here's the other question. Do we know any wise men who were in Babylon? The answer to that biblically is yes to both. And so the most famous magi from the east in the Bible is Daniel. Take your Bible and join me in Daniel. Go all the way back. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or excuse me, Lament- excuse me, let me get it right. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then we'll get to Daniel. The Bible says something about Daniel in Daniel 2 in verse 48. The Bible says that Daniel was the chief, listen to this, wise man in Babylon. 
Now, we're not going to do a lot of work in, 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 the, uh, in the original languages this morning, and some of you say, praise God. But this section in Daniel, Daniel starts out in chapter 2 writing in Hebrew, and then he switches his writing to Aramaic. And so anyway, without doing much of that heavy lifting exegetical work from this angle, just trust me, that word corresponds to the same word magi that Matthew uses. So Daniel 2.48, it says that Nebuchadnezzar promoted Daniel as the chief wise man in Babylon. Now, we can't be sure, but I believe that there is a case to make that these wise men from the east in Matthew who were following the star, I believe that they were students of Daniel. And it only makes sense for us to even consider that. It's not far-fetched. Daniel wrote this book. We're still reading works that he wrote. How many in your philosophy classes, how many times do you have to read people that have been read through the ages? It only makes sense that there would be a group of people that would be consistent and follow after Daniel's own writings. So I don't think it's a stretch for us to say that the, uh, the wise men from the east who followed his star were students of Daniel. And so here's what I want to do, and this is exciting. Over the next few weeks, here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time in Daniel, and we're going to discover what Daniel's writings say about Jesus. And let me go ahead and say this. Because Christmas time is coming, we're going to have to be very selective. We're not going to be able to cover all of Daniel, but we can discover enough to discover what made the wise men travel from afar to follow his star. So let's start somewhere in Daniel. Let's start in Daniel chapter 2. Take your Bible and join me in Daniel chapter 2. And I'll summarize the whole thing for you, and you already see it on the screen here. Daniel chapter 2 tells us this. There is a coming kingdom that will be indestructible. There is a kingdom that is coming that will be indestructible. Daniel chapter 2, as I was reading it in my study this week to just get ready for this moment, I'm just tempted today to just read Daniel chapter 2 and sit down, but we won't do that. We'll read a lot of Daniel chapter 2, but here's what I'm going to entrust you to do. You go home afterwards, and you look, after you've taken notes in this sermon, you go home and you look at Daniel chapter 2 in its entirety. It's a beautiful passage. The whole passage, by the way, in Daniel chapter 2 is summarized. What's Daniel chapter 2 about? Well, Daniel chapter 2 in verse 20 through 23 tells us what Daniel 2 is about. And it does so by giving us this poem, this hymn, this song. And so, really, the whole message that I'm going to bring before you today is centered on Daniel 2, 20 through 23. But before we get there, I want to sort of set the stage and tell the story. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2, the first six verses. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled. His sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we'll show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So, what's going on here? Well, the king, the Bible calls him, Daniel calls him, as a matter of fact, in verse 30, 37, the king of kings, he's having trouble sleeping. And God was speaking to this conquering pagan king through his dreams. 
And this king, as the proverb says, the heart of the king is like water in the hands of the Lord. In other words, it's, it's nothing to be considered for God. This pagan king is being used by God to bring about his own purpose, to bring judgment to his people, also that God in his grand plan could win, listen, could win the hearts of his people back to him. He allows his people to undergo judgment so that not he can teach them a lesson. No, that's what legalism would have us to say. No, the Bible is a message of grace and redemption. The Bible says that he, uh, the, the message is, is that he lets them undergo this judgment so that he can win their hearts back to him. So you remember the last time we were together, we looked at Numbers chapter 24, and that was when the, the, the Lord spoke to a pagan prophet while his people were wandering in the wilderness. And we're a long way from that time. We're a long way from Numbers chapter 24. Now the people are in exile. Now Jerusalem has been sacked. Now Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple is no more. Now it looks like the promises of God have been carried away by a pagan ruler. But in the midst of all of that, God still has a message for His people. God still has His servants that are set up in strategic locations. God has not forgotten. He's not abandoned. As the message of Ezekiel says, that, you know, the presence of the Lord is here and there. It's everywhere. It's not contained in the one spot. God hadn't forgotten. The point is, is that God has a plan. And here, God shows Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, his whole plan for the future. But he doesn't just show him the plan for the future as if the future is just out there somewhere and that's what's going to happen. No, he shows him how the people and God fit into the plan and purpose of God. So oftentimes when we think about the future, we think about, well, we're just, you know, on a conveyor belt and we hit start and, you know, we start doing this angle. It's not that. God has a plan. He has a purpose. We're not just innocent bystanders. He includes us in the unfolding events around us. And so the king has a dream. And his advisors, they can't tell him the dream. Look at what they say at verses 10 through 11. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, listen to this language. There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. And then look at verse 11. The thing that the king asked is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And what was the king's response? Well, this enraged the king, and so then he gives an order that all the wise men in Babylon are to be destroyed. And if there's one guy who has the power to do what he says, it's this guy. It's Nebuchadnezzar. If Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, tell me the dream or I'm going to rip your arms off, he can do it. And that's the fear that we're supposed to have in, in, this, in the text. And so then, after all, after he gives the decree, then enters our hero, Daniel. And Daniel, his life, because he is among the wise men, Daniel's life is in jeopardy. And by the way, let me take an aside before we go further. His life, Daniel's life, and the life of his friends, as we read the Bible, they are always in constant jeopardy in the book of Daniel. Even though he is elevated, even though he's honored, even though he has high positions, and at the end of this chapter, in chapter 2, we're going to see he is elevated above everyone else. He always has an uneasy conscience in Babylon. And Christian, there is a message for us right there. No matter how far you progress, no matter how high you go, remember this, Christian, that you were not made for this world. And as C.S. Lewis said, if I find in my heart a desire for which nothing in this world can satisfy, 
Lewis said, the only logical conclusion is I must be made for another world. And Christian, there's a lot of good in this world. Don't hear me, but always listen to me. The story of Scripture is to set your mind's eye and your heart on eternity. And remember this, what good is it for you to gain the entire world and just lose your soul in the end? We're always supposed to be leveraging whatever God gives us and living our life with this eternal perspective because this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So Daniel, he went in and he asked the king for more time. Look at, look at this response. And there's a, there's a parallel that's being drawn in the text between Daniel's response and the king's response, but I'll get there. But Daniel, what does he do? He gathers his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You probably know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's right. And what do they do? Well, they do what every believer should do when they have troubling news. They get together and they have a prayer meeting. And verse 19 says that God revealed the mystery. And as a result of God revealing the mystery, Daniel sings a song of praise. Look at it in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows, look at this, he knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. And really, beloved, the whole message is in this section. But for our purposes, let's keep reading. Daniel comes before the king at verse 26. Let's pick up there. Daniel 2, 26. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Oh, get this scene before we go any further. Get this scene. There's been a delay. There's already been a decree. The way the text gives is like Daniel comes and knocks down the door, and finally, there's, yes, wait, wait, before we start pulling people's arms off, let's wait, before we start burning people's houses, hey, I've got the interpretation. And so finally, Daniel gets an audience with the king, and he says, hey, are you able to tell me what I dreamed? Still with anger in his voice. And look at what Daniel says. No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a Elohim, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar, look at this, what will be in the latter days, at the end of time. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. He who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. And then look at Daniel's posture. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Just as Daniel prayed for the interpretation, he didn't dream up the interpretation on his own. He didn't, you know, throw a bunch of bones out or look at the sand or he didn't look at the stars. No, he prayed. He prayed. And God gave him the interpretation. So just as he prayed, so he goes in with the audacity and with the boldness 
And that's going to serve him later, a little later when he's cast into the lion's den. That same kind of boldness. He wants to make it clear that the interpretation doesn't belong to him. It's not his. You know what the message there for us that Daniel is telling us? Daniel says, it's not because of something I could do, should do, might do, or could have done. Daniel's telling the king the gospel message that you and I know any good we have comes from the Lord. Daniel's telling the king that salvation belongs to the Lord. Well, what's the dream? Look at verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you. Its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken in pieces, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel gives the interpretation of the dream after he tells him the dream. The statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees represents all of humanity. And in this dream, Nebuchadnezzar is the golden head. You say, what's that about? Well, verse 38 and 39 tells us he represents the dominion, the power, and the glory that humanity was created to enjoy, listen, before the fall. But notice the details. It's all in the details. The statue deteriorates in excellence as we move. We start out at fine gold. Don't miss that. Then we move to silver, to bronze, to iron. By the time we make it to the feet, that's where we see the deterioration most suddenly. The feet are a mixture of iron and clay. Now, there have been so many uh, speculations and suggestions as to which kingdom is represented by each part of this statue. And I could show you a chart, and I could, we could have a history lesson here today, and I could talk about Alexander the Great, or I could talk about, you know, uh, uh, maybe the Roman Empire, but, you know, the text just doesn't say that. The text only identifies Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold. What's the point of that? The point of the image in the deterioration is to tell us. And this is Daniel telling the king who wants to establish a dynasty that's going to last forever. The point is, is that any attempt at progress apart from God is no progress at all. I want you to get that, believer, those of you who are listening any attempt at progress apart from God, look at the statue, is no progress at all. Matter of factly, if we do a little evaluation, we might not even be aware of how really worse we make things by trying to make things better. After all, think about our society. We do our best to, to hide the brokenness in the shadows. That's why we always turn the channel when Sarah McLaughlin comes on this time of the year, having us to give money for the pets, right? We all turn the channel because we would rather have something happy. And that's okay. That's just part of our condition. But our society does its best to gloss over it all. To give you this false sense, you're the number one. 
It's all about you. And everybody else's life is not as good as yours. But the biblical picture is not bleak. Don't hear me say that. It's not all bad news. But here's what the Bible does say. The Bible makes it clear that things will get better when Jesus comes, but not before. And speaking of Jesus coming, in the dream, notice this detail. There's a stone that strikes the statue standing, this statue standing as a tower of Babel, this statue standing as a Goliath. And here's this little stone, this stone that comes and strikes the statue. And the small stone or the stone not cut by human hands brings the whole thing down. Daniel tells the king in chapter 2 and verse 44, and in those days, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Think about what Daniel is saying, this exile in the presence of a king. He says, on that day, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, it shall stand forever. And just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. And then Daniel has the audacity to say the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. How incredible. And here is the gospel. Don't miss this. God takes what is insignificant and overlooked. A little baby born in Bethlehem. An overlooked insignificant death on a cross. A ragamuffin band of disciples who gathered together and were outnumbered 30,000 to one with the threat of the emperor on their neck, Nero. John paints the picture when he's telling the Christmas story in Revelation of a dragon chasing the church. And these ones, this ragamuffin band of disciples, the ones that Jesus said, on this small stone I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail This band of disciples who said the once crucified one is now alive. God causes these little things, once they're understood, to become the focal points of our entire existence. The whole world revolves now around a cross. You see, the world as we know it, as John Baer says, the world as we know it, it may It may move, but the cross stands still as the world turns. There is no other confession that can bring salvation. There is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. And that's the message of Christmas. That's the message that these wise men came to adore. That's the message that we preach every every day, not just on Sundays. Stone that was not cut by human hands. In other words, it's not our idea, not our plan. Grows into a large mountain. As another exilic prophet would say, the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. And the invitation from that The invitation that's right there, this God in heaven who's giving this pagan king a dream, this conquering king who is an instrument in the hands of God, who thinks that he's mighty, but in the end, he's just another tool in God's hand. The invitation that Daniel says, he says this dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. There's nothing you can do, Nebuchadnezzar, to change it. And how do you respond by being confronted with the fact that there is one day coming a king whose kingdom is indestructible. 
Well, the king responds at verse 46 through 49, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face. Look at the change from I'm going to rip an arm off to now he's bowing. He paid homage to Daniel, commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your Elohim is Elohim. Truly your God is God of gods, Lord of kings, and revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. And then the king gave Daniel high honors, here's our passage, and many great gifts made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king. Why not, right? King's in a good mood now. He made a request. He appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. No, the king is so close here to the kingdom. It looks as if there's been a transformation in the heart of the king, but there's not. It's just been all right here. And it's a reminder for us that many, that Jesus says that on the last day, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, and he will say, I never knew you. The king is so close. But what does he do? In chapter 3, we won't be able to get into that, but chapter 3 tells us that that old King Neb, he just didn't get it. He interpreted it, oh, well, since I'm the golden head, I might as well go ahead and set up a golden statue, and I might as well just command everybody to fall down and worship. But there were three that were there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Chapter 3 tells us that they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, and they wouldn't burn, but that's another sermon for another day. But the point is, is it, look, at how, look at the contrast. When Daniel and his friends, they receive the dream, they bow in worship and adoration, and they sing a praise hymn to God. When King Nebuchadnezzar, full of his own hard-heartedness, missing the fact that just a stone is going to come and make everything that he's ever built toppled. By the way, don't miss this. If you're not a believer here today, there is something standing in the way of all of your progress, and it's a king who is coming with an indestructible kingdom, and you will never be able to get beyond him or past him. The only thing for you is to join him and worship him. So how should you respond? What's the message that God has for us today from this dream We should respond by recognizing the way, recognizing what Daniel and his friends recognized from the hymn of verse 20 through 23. Now, these are going to come very fast. Get your pen ready. Number one, God is everlasting. Verse 20 says, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Remember this, believer. Kings come and go. Regimes come and go. Politicians and presidents and all the rest come and go but God remains forever. Number two, God gives wisdom. Look at verse 21. He gives wisdom to the wise. Listen, only God is the source of true wisdom. And here's the invitation of the Bible. You can find Him when you search for Him with all of your heart. The third thing that we should learn is that God rules over all. Verse 22 says, He knows what is in the darkness. What a passage. And the light dwells with Him. That's a whole sermon there. You see, a king might have control for a dynasty, but all the power he enjoys is given to him by God who rules over all. And number four, The praise of God will last forever. Daniel sings at verse 20, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. And then at verse 23, he says, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. So what about you? How do you make sense of the world? The wise men knew something. For them, on the day that they visited Jesus, the answer was not only in the stars, 
but the answer was in a book. You see, the king born under the star is the one Nebuchadnezzar saw who would one day come and bring an end of all the kingdoms of this world. The stone cut by human hands would become a mountain that fills the earth. His kingdom will stand forever. And the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as you live and as you make your decisions, as you progress through life, as you pursue things, just ask yourself this question. Am I pursuing what lasts? And remember this, only Jesus lasts forever. Are you presenting your life as a living offering to Him, saying, Lord, here it is, the talents you've given me, the treasures you've given me, the time that you've given me, it's all a gift. I give it back to you every day, every morning, every moment. You see, we're standing right now, we are standing on the horizon and we see what's coming. As Christians, and when we see what's coming, it gives us hope. Because what we see coming, according to the Word of the Lord, is an indestructible kingdom. And in the end, you will either be with Him, or you will be apart from Him. But you will never be over Him for all eternity. And it's my prayer that you will turn to Him, trust in Him, give yourself to Him today. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for Your Word, how heavy it is, but what confidence it gives us to go into every sphere as we think about what it means to live sent, as we think about what it means to, to have this life that You've given us, Lord, leveraged. Lord, as Jonathan Edwards used to pray, stamp eternity on our sight. Help us to see with true vision who it is that will reign forever. May every heart today, within the sound of my voice, bow allegiance to King Jesus, the one whose kingdom is coming and indestructible. Thank you for our King. Thank you for our Christ. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in His name that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen.